Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Um, welcome to the ORMF Production Masterclass. My name's Erica. Um, I'm the design director here at ORMF, and today I'll just take you through some tools, a few tips and tricks, and some ORMF features that you can use to speed up um, your production process. Um, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, um, just type them in the question box. Um, Jack's helping me out today, so he'll be able to answer your questions. Otherwise, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a question and answer time as well, where you guys can fire off some questions, um, and we can see if we can answer them for you. Um, so I'll get started. Um, basically, just a brief overview of what we'll cover today. Um, firstly, we'll cover Oomph Editor. Um, some of you might know what this is, some of you might not, but it's Oomph Editor is pretty much a desktop tool. Um, it's what I'm using at the moment, and it's just an easy way to test um, and view your files. Um, after that, we'll just go into InDesign. Um, I'll just show you a few tips and tricks, a few things to consider just to make your workflow um, run a bit smoothly or more smoothly. And then we'll move into Shared Assets, um, which is an all feature. And then we'll go into setting up templates, um, just going through what templates are, how you use them, and how they can obviously make your workflow run smoother and a bit better. So I'll start off with Oomph Editor. So like I said before, Oomph Editor is a desktop tool and basically it lets you view your files and preview your files on the iPad. So, oh, sorry, on your desktop. So I'll quickly open it up. So show you the files I'm viewing at the moment. So this is my bundle, and here it comes up in all editor. So basically, as you can see, I can view my files here on the left-hand side, and I can open up my folders, and in here I can select my links. So if we go to the page we're currently on, you can see there's my link that's going to link to my page, the Oomph Editor page. Similar, this is my page that links to my InDesign Tips page. So you can also drag on features from Oomph Editor. So say you've worked on a file, um, you quickly just need to drag on a notes widget. You can drag that on there. And then you can simply call this note. Or similarly, if you need to add a quick page link, you can drag that on there and just type in, say, we want to link to the cover. You can add that in there. So to use then, once you've edited your files in Oomph Editor, to then test them on your desktop, what you'll need to do is install something called Xcode. Um, to bring up this iOS simulator. So this is the simulator, which is, just as the name suggests, is pretty much simulating my iPad on screen. So you can either use this, or you can actually send, send it directly to your iPad. So if you have a look at the top here, at the moment I'm connected to my simulator because I want to send my artwork to my simulator. But if I had an iPad connected, then I would be able to choose iPad, and then I can just press the play button and it will send it directly to my iPad. But for today, because obviously you won't be able to see my iPad, we're going to just do it on the simulator. So to install both of these, I'll just go back to my simulator and on my page. So to install Oomph Editor and Xcode, you can go to the support page on Oomph and we'll post the link for you as well. So if you just look at this page here, there's a link for you to download Oomph Editor. Um, so there's Oomph Editor for Mac and there's Oomph Editor for Windows. Just to call out, the Windows version doesn't have all the functionality that the Mac version has. Um, so just keep that in mind when you download it. But it does enable you to open up um, Oomph files. And then in there, we've got the link to download Xcode. So I'll just go there. Or it might be easier, we'll just do it from our iTunes account. Okay. 
and it's not going to bring it up for me. So I'm going to go directly to the App Store and I'll show you guys. where you can download it. So I'll just quickly search in there, Xcode. And we'll wait for that to come up. So Oomph Editor is quite quick to download. Xcode can maybe take a few minutes, so um, just keep that in mind before you install it. But once you've got both of them installed, um, you can just do what I've done here open up your editor, you navigate to your files, and then you'll be able to test on your simulator. All right, let's see if that's come up. Yep, here it's come up in the App Store, and here you can see there's Xcode. I've installed it already, it's telling me I need an update, um, but if you go in there, you can obviously just click on there and install it. All right, so that's a brief overview of Oomph Editor. We'll be using it throughout um, this webinar, uh, so you'll have you can see pretty much how we use it in our workflow as well. Um, I'll then move on to InDesign tips. So again, these are just a few things that we use to make it easier um, when we work on projects. I think everyone's probably got their own way of setting up or own preferences of setting up their workspace. Um, but these are just a few tips and tricks that we find very helpful um, when we work on projects. So the first thing I'll cover, um, and again, this might be obvious to a lot of people, it might not be, is setting up your own workspace. So as you can see, I'll just move these things out of the way so you can actually see my workspace. Actually, I'll go back and I'll reset it. And I think everything's off my screen now. All right, I'll just delete those. And I'll reset oomph. There we go. So as you can see, on the right-hand side there, basically what I've done, I've just put in all the features or dialog boxes that I use all the time when creating an oomph document. So obviously hyperlinks are probably one of the most important ones, that's what you're going to use all the time. And then, you know, characters, paragraph styles, all the usual ones that you set up. And then, of course, pages and layers and swatches. So once you set up your workspace and you're happy with it, all you need to do is you go to your window, tab at the top, and then select workspace, and then you can say new workspace. And then, obviously, you can call this whatever you want to. So I would say, I'm going to call it. Eric Oomph, because I've already got an Oomph workspace. And then you press OK. And then if you go in there, you can see there's Eric Oomph workspace, which I can reset, or I can choose any other workspace that I might have set up. So now we've got our workspace ready. The next thing that we need to do before we get stuck into designing is setting up your export settings. Again, this is something that you've probably done at the start when you start using Oomph. Um, but I thought it's worthwhile going through it again just so that you know how to do that. So to do a new export setting is we go to File, tab at the top, we go to Adobe, PDF Presets, and we say Define. And again, we're going to create a new export. And I'm just going to use very couple again. And then we just need to make sure we've got all our settings right. So the most important thing um, on the general tab that you need to have a, or need to have activated is your hyperlinks. Obviously, if they don't work, then none of your features will be working when you export your PDFs. And then on the next compression tab, we'll set our um, resolution to 132. I'll just do it for all of them. And the only other thing then, so we don't need any crops of lead, obviously, because it's not for print. And then the only other thing that I like to do is change 
my color output, which is in here, and I just change it to that RGB setting. The reason for that is if say if you work from a print document to um, an iPad document and you'd normally you'd go in and change all your colors to from CMYK to RGB but sometimes you know one or two things can slip through this way it will actually convert that to RGB and you won't end up with those um, terrible sort of saturated colors that CMYK creates on the iPad so all right so then we press OK and we've created our preset. So there you can see it comes up there. So now if I'm ready to export my page, I can just go there and there's my Erica all preset and I can go ahead and export my PDF page. All right, so we'll then move on to our next little tip. So we've covered our workspace, we've covered our presets. I'll then go into how we set up layers when we work on a document. So again, this will be personal preference, um, but this is just sort of a neat way of organizing your files and, and it might change from document to document. But if we have a look at our document here, normally what we do is we'll have an artwork layer. You might have more than one artwork layer to make it easier to select elements on the page. But up here I've got only one artwork layer because my pages are quite simple. So we put them on there. And I don't have all of them on here because I've created them as links. And then all the other layers that I want to be able to quickly hide when I want to export pages, I've set up as different layers. So for example, we'll go into shared assets in the moment, but I've set this up as a shared layer so I can easily hide that. This is another shared layer, which is on another page. And then I've got something, and I'll go down so you can have a look at why I've set it up like this. I've got something called, a layer called hide. And basically, these are the elements that will not be on my page when I export them, but I just want them on the layout to see where they're gonna sit and what they're gonna look like. So in this example, I've got two little buttons there, and I've got those social sharing buttons at the top that won't be exported with my page. They'll be objects that I'll export, but I just have them on a layer to know where they're sitting on my page. So in this example, I've used shared layers. Um, if you're using animation, you might want to add a layer that has your animation on it. So today, maybe we want to animate that title at the top if we want to animate that in, we can say it could be P1-2 moving from left and then you can select that and put it on that layer. So just it's a good way naming your layers, organizing the elements on your page so when you get to exporting it's quite easy to hide what you need to hide when you want to export and sort of organize your files and elements. All right, so we'll then move on to pages. So here I've got my pages set up. So at the moment, what we've got here is, again, because this is a simple document, um, all our pages are just set up underneath each other and then all our elements are underneath our pages. But if you're starting to get quite a complex document and you might want to create a landscape version of that document, it helps to actually use something um, so we'll go in here. called alternate layouts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an alternate layout. From, so I'm just going to copy pretty much the same that I've got in my A master. And we'll create 
that there. All right, so that's brought it up for me. I, I did that before, so it's already done it, so I'll just, I'll just delete that alternate layout that I just created. So basically what I want to do, I've separated my pages, so you can see these are all my pages, downloaded, and then I've created an alternate layout like I did before and just deleted those pages. So then I've got all my objects in a layout so I can easily access them and see them. So I don't, especially if you've got a document that's, you know, about 50 pages long, you don't want to have to go through all of them and go and try and find the Twitter. One row. And then say you've decided now you've created your portrait view, but you want to create a landscape view. So what we can then do, so the first thing we'll do is we'll go to our liquid layout settings. So for those of you that don't know liquid layouts, it's pretty much, it's a useful tool, but it's unfortunately, it does, it's not foolproof in that it will help you to get all your elements from a portrait page to a landscape page, but it's not going to magically resize it. Um, so you've got a few liquid layout rules that you can follow. So you can either tell it from portrait to landscape, scale it to the new page size, or if it's object based, you can, for example, take that object and pin it. So you'd always say pin it to the top left. So there's a few rules that you go, could go into and it, it all depends on the project as well, um, whether you want to spend that time to pin elements to a page or whether you just want to get your elements on a landscape page and then it's easier just to go in and manually rejig them. So what I'm going to do, so I'm just going to use the recenter rule. So we've got that in there. And then I'm going to create an alternate layout for my portrait pages and I'm going to call this landscape. And we can see I've selected my landscape page size. And in here, I can also select my liquid layout rules. And there we can see I've created my landscape layout. And like I said before, it's unfortunately not a magic tool where you can just go in and it will resize it perfectly. You're going to have to go in and resize things. But at least now I've got all my elements on the page, I can quickly move them around and create a landscape version. And especially if you've got, you know, slideshows and you've gone in there and you've actually put in um, your features and your hyperlinks on top of that, at least all your elements are on that page and you can quickly rejig it and design it for landscape as well. All right, so that covers our pages. The last thing in InDesign Again, which is something a lot of you guys will probably know, but I thought it'd be worth covering it, is when working with objects. So if you're um, on CC, which I'm presuming most people are now, that you can subscribe to it, um, you've got this wonderful little resize or page resize tool, which is great in terms of creating icons or if you have images that you want to export from your file, so basically you can create just any size page that you want to. So in this example, we've got our little mail icon. And as you can see, I can just resize my page to fit that icon. So you can either do it with the tool. So if I hold an option and I just scale it up, I can just manually do it like this. Or you can go into your X and Y icon, um, your coordinates at the top. So what we can do is we can just say we want this to be 45, 45 and place our artwork on there. So we find that's a tool that we use quite a bit um, and that way you can have all your elements all in one document. So everything's in one place. It's not like you've got a document open with your objects and you've got a different document with your portrait pages and then you've got a different document with your landscape pages. You've got all, everything all in one place. 
So the other thing that relates to icons and um, navigation as well that's quite useful is um, something called the content collector tool. So I'll bring it up. And basically what it is, so it's, it's very useful for some for elements that you're going to reuse on the page as you continue to design. So in this example, I've got my little Twitter icon. So I know I'm going to put this on, say, every page. Twitter icon might not be the best example. An arrow, a navigation arrow, would probably be the most obvious example that you'll use. So basically, what I do is I select my content selector tool, and I go in and I select my my element and it's not working because I've selected my hyperlink and not my so I'll just take that one out right. let's delete those and we'll go again so there I've selected my Twitter icon and then I can go down and I want to say I want to select my Facebook icon as well. So here you can see now I've got my Twitter, Facebook, and now if I want to place it, we've got this little content placer tool. So I'll just go through and then I can select which one I want to place. So I want to select the Twitter one. And you've got some settings here at the bottom. So you can say only place it once and remove it, but we don't want to remove it. We actually want to keep it there to use it again later. So if you want to place it multiple times, you can have that setting there or place it once and keep it in the way. So I'd normally use the last one. And that pretty much means now I've got my little Twitter icon and I can just click and it's placed it on there and it automatically loads the next icon if you want to use that. Otherwise, you just go on and you've got your icon and you can start designing. Again, I've just done this just with the icon, but ideally you probably want to do it with your hyperlink attached to it so you don't have to draw the hyperlink over the top of it. Again, you've got your little bundle with the link on top of it and you can just place that element whenever you need it. All right, so that I think is all our little tips from InDesign. Um, We'll then move on to the oomph features um, that makes production quicker and easier. So here I've got my page, just the recipe page, um, and we're going to look at shared assets. So basically shared assets, what they are is elements, again, a bit like the Twitter, Facebook, mail icon that we were working with before. But these are elements that you're going to use on all your sections or on a lot of your sections um, in, your, in your app. So instead of having to cut them out and put folders in each section folder, you can actually just put it in one place and oomph will pull those assets in only from that one place. So obviously, this makes it much easier if you want an update an asset, say you've decided you don't want that Twitter icon to be blue anymore, you want, want it to be blue on white, then you only change that one instance and it changes throughout your app. Um, the other thing is in terms of file size as well, you're not repeating elements over and over again, so it makes your file smaller. And it's just an easier way of working. So let me quickly show you what this looks like. So I'll bring up my files here. And as you can see, this is my folders here. And I've got all my section folders in here. And then I've got a folder called shared assets. So you can have lots of different shared assets, as you can see in here. So We'll start with our little icons. So continuing on with the Twitter icon. So this is a shared Twitter asset. And as you can see, I've just saved that in there as a PDF. Same here, we've got the OMP logo that's in white that we've saved in, our little mail icon. So these are all shared throughout 
our document. And all I need to do then is if on a page I want this Twitter icon to appear, and I'll just navigate to my page. And my hyperlink, just zoom in so we can see what we're doing. You can see I've just called that hyperlink Twitter icon, and that's going to mean Oomph is going to get that Twitter icon from the shared folder. Same here, we've got the Facebook icon, Oomph is going to get that icon from the Facebook folder. So, oh, let me just bring up my. So, just so what Oomph will do, just so you know, sort of in the order that it reads files. So we're working in the shared assets folder. So what Oomph will do in our PDF, he will see, okay, we've got three links on there called Twitter icon, email icon. If it doesn't see those assets in your main folder, it will automatically go to the shared folder and go and look for it in there. So say if there's an instance that you want to override this Twitter icon, so say your color scheme in your shared assets section is going to be green and not blue, um, then you can actually just take this Twitter icon here and if we paste it in there and if we change this out, so I might actually quickly do an example so we can see the difference. So, just bring this up. And we'll just change a little bit to blue. Background to white, and we'll delete that. And we'll export that into our folder. So we'll replace that shared icon there. And we're going to be in the objects, and I think I'm on page three. Have a look now. Do is we'll just delete that and then we'll go again. Let's just confirm I'm on page three. All right, so then we've exported our new to icon in there. So if we then go back into Form Editor. So I don't need to load this again. The changes that has been made to my folder will be reflected in the editor. So if we go in here, you can see there's my Twitter icon that I've added and I can see it in there. So all I need to do is just run it in the simulator again and it's going to bring it up. So we'll go to shared assets and as you can see there at the bottom, it's overridden the shared Twitter icon. All right, so we'll go back. And we'll have a look at some other shared icons that we've got on the page. So we've got these cooking mode icons, so they shared as well. And if we go back to our page, I'll show you we've added some animation onto them. So I've put them on my hidden layer, and as you can see, here's my objects, my shared objects. And if we have a look at our shared objects, this is called the cooking button. And because I want it to pulse when you come onto the page, I've put an animation at the back of it. So cooking the pulse. Same with this, I've called this back the pulse. So we'll go back to our folder. So because this is an object, we'll see these in our object folder. 
and because we've put an animation on this as well that's going to be shared throughout the document, you're going to have a shared animations folder as well. So in here, you can see this is my pulse animation. So again, this will work exactly the same if I want my pulse animation to behave differently. Just for that section, I can create a folder over here called animation and change it out. But for the moment, we'll use our shared animation. So just to show you how that looks, I go back and go to shared assets. There you can see my two buttons are pulsing when I come in there. So again, very useful if you've got a pulsing button on each page. You don't have to actually go in, type it in for each page or copy and paste it to each page. You've done it once um, and you can use it once and update it quite easily. All right, so that's covering shared animations and shared objects. The other thing we've got is shared layers. So my bottom bar here is a shared layer as well as these little icons at the bottom, they're actually on a shared layer as well. So you get two different types of shared layers. You get a default shared layer, and then you get a specific shared layer, or you can specify your shared layer. So a default shared layer is pretty much exactly what it says. As we can see here, it's got our bottom bar there. So that means this layer is going to be applied to every single page. So I've put it on some of them already, but this layer will be on top of every single section page that we've got. So I wanted this bottom bar to be on every page of my presentation, and that way I've only created one shared layer, and it's going to put it on each page. So. If we go back to our folder, it's important to name your shared layer a high number, um, just for the obvious fact that you might have, you know, four layers in your actual document, whether it's animation or anything else, um, and you always want your shared layer to be on top. So in this case, I've just called it P1-99. And the other type of layer that we get is a specific layer that you can attach to a specific section folder. So in this case, I've called it social. So I'm going to open this up so you can actually see my hyperlinks on here. So as you can see, I've just got my three little hyperlinks on here, which is my social sharing button. So we've got mail icon. And I only want this to appear on my shared assets section like I've outlined here. So to do that, what you need to do is just add this to the folder. So if I go to my folder, so I've already added it in there, but you just use the pipe and you just type in the shared asset layer name. So if we then go back to our viewer, so we've just added it to our templates. So you can see templates social and we play this in our simulator. We can go to templates and we can see we've got that shared layer coming up over the top. So it's as simple as that. So you've got shared objects that you can have throughout your document. You've got shared animations. Again, so if you want that animation to behave similar throughout the document, you can just put them in that animation folder once. And then you've got shared default layers. So some a layer that you want to appear on every single section of your document, or you've got specific shared layers that you can specify which layer will be attached to which section. All right, so we'll go back to our folder again. So you'll see in here we've got two other shared folders called CSS and fonts. Um, and 
basically, again, it's going to be, I'll explain them more in the templates folder, but you can have shared fonts that's going to be used throughout your document and shared CSS that's throughout the document. All right, so I'll then quickly move on to templates. So just bring this up. So as you can see, this is almost a copy of my InDesign page that I've got here. So what are templates? Templates are pretty much sections that look the same in each issue of your app. So it might be something, we've got an example here that's a recipe and say your recipe, the structure is always going to be the same from issue to issue. This is a really effective way of setting up your, um, your section and it just makes it so much easier and quicker to update it, say if it's each month or with um, the production of each issue. It's obviously got some restrictions in that you preset the structure um, and the layout. So it's not that flexible that you can decide at the last minute you want to change it. And, and you have to consider things, um, not necessarily word count, but you can, um, you can allow for the word count, but in terms of the structure of the information, the type of information always needs to be sort of quite similar for this to work. So a recipe is quite a good example. And what I'll do is I'll show you how we've set this up. So zoom out a bit. So this is my page just set up in InDesign with my text in InDesign. And if I scroll down, this is my template page that I've set up to contain that same information. So in here, you'll see I've got a area or a hotspot for my recipe image. I've got a VIPS, which my text is going to go into, and I've got a recipe title. And I've kept my pulsing buttons in here as well. So to create a template, it's going to probably take longer to set up. So as you can see, you probably what the process of doing it is you design your page, like we've got it here, and then you'd go in and almost cut out the elements on your page. So we'll start with our recipe image. So this is like any hotspot, we just call it a descriptive name, so I call this recipe image. And if I go to my pages, you'll see here, I've set up my recipe image in there. And we'll go to our folder. And in here, you'll see I've created a folder called recipe image. And I've just realized I've exported all the files and not just one file, which is not going to work. So I'll call it S1 1. And there's my image in there. Then I've got my recipe title. So, in terms of a template, you can use different types of files. So in my recipe image, because it's an image, it's quite obviously it's obviously going to be a JPEG or a PNG um, or PDF if you want to use a PDF. Then in terms, if we start using text, um, you can just export this because we're using VIPS. You can just put it on your page in InDesign and export it as a VIPS. But because we want it to keep it very easy to update, we're going to change it into a text object. So I'll just show you what I mean by text object. So you can just open this up in text edit. And pretty much in here, you'll see it's my Harissa Landstrangs thing it serves for. So say I've made a mistake and I realize this recipe actually serves six. I can change that to six. Save, save that out and then we can just go in and we'll preview it again. Not fewer. Or editor, sorry. And we'll go in there and you can see I've just updated to save serve six. I don't have to go back into my InDesign file, change it to six, export the PDF. All those steps are eliminated. I can just simply open up a text file and change, change the value. 
website. I'll just quickly show you how that hotspot for that title works as well. So going back in here. So as you can see, we've named it recipe title. So again, any descriptive name that you prefer. And then I've put something at the end of it called Smart Fit. So Smart Fit, basically what that is, it just tells them if there's content that extends beyond this box, just extend the box to fit that content. So it's as simple as that. So basically what Ulf does, I've made my box quite thin. So obviously my text at that size, I think it's 0.21, is not going to fit within that box. But Smart Fit just tells them, okay, the content's too big for the box, just extend it down. So I've done that there with Smart Fit. So that's, I've just used this as a simple example on a title. Obviously, if you've got, you know, long form text, this works really well. And what it will do is it will actually extend the page as well. So if we had this as Smart so at the moment, I've used an HTML example, but say this is a text file and we've used this as Smart Fit as well. and say this will, it's going to extend beyond my page, it will actually push down your page as well. So it will automatically make it a tall page. So it's a very useful feature to use. All right, so I'll then move on to my main content box or vertical in-page slideshow. So this again is another we call it a text object that we can use, but I've actually, what I've used in here, I wanted to show you an example of HTML. So it's a lot less scary than you think it is. <laughs> but basically, we use HTML for certain things that is hard to achieve within a text object. So specifically here, we wanted these little bullets to come in on our ingredients. So just using a simple text object is going to make that very hard to achieve. So we've just set it up in an HTML structure. So you can, I normally view this with Text Wrangler. You can open it up in Text Edit. Um, there's quite a few editors that you can use, but I'll just show you what this looks like. So when you first open it up, it might look a bit scary, but I'll take you through everything we've got in here. So we'll just start with the content. So basically, we've got our P tags. So I won't go too much into HTML. Um, again, we'll share these files with you afterwards so you can have a look at it. But just to show you sort of the simple structure, you've got a body um, and you've got within your body, you then have paragraphs, headings, and this is a list that we've set up here. And then again, we've got a heading, and then we've got our paragraphs as well. So the reason we're specifying our headings, our lists, and our paragraphs, it gives us the ability to style this much easier than it would be if it's just a text object. Because a text object is only going to give us the content, whereas in HTML, we actually have little tags attached to all our content, and then we can take CSS and style our content. So I'll take you to the CSS in a minute. But in here we can see we've got the a head as well. So and in this head we're actually telling this HTML document to go and grab our recipe CSS and go and grab the fonts that we've specified. So earlier in our shared folder, we mentioned we've got a shared fonts folder and a shared CSS folder. So this is exactly what this HTML file is pointing to. So pretty much it just says go and look in a forward slash forward slash so go and look in folders called shared CSS and read the font CSS file and similar with the recipes file. So We'll then go in and I'll show you 
my recipe CSS. Again, I won't go into too much of how CSS works. We'll share these files with you. But it's quite straightforward in that basically in here I've specified my tag that I said this is heading one. And then if I go into my CSS, you can see here and here I've specified my heading one. So I've said here I want my heading one to be the Musea Sans font family. I want the weight to be 100. I want the size to be 16. And I want the line height to be 25 and the color to be black. So I've actually specified that for all my text. And then I actually want my heading to have a bit more space at the top. So you can add padding at the top. I want it to be a thicker font. So again, you can specify that font. And and these are just sort of other bits and pieces that we've used to style this content that we've got in here. So that's our recipe CSS. So the other CSS that we're referencing is the font CSS. So the reason we're doing this, uh, I'll just go back to my folder and open it up, is we're using non-iOS fonts. So Enable for, in order for that to show up, we need to actually include them in our bundle. So we've included our fonts in here. So this is our shared font, shared fonts folder, and we've put in all the fonts we're using in here. But we now need a CSS document to tell to tell where to find those fonts and tell this HTML file where to find those fonts. So this is sort of our fonts statement CSS, for lack of a better word. So as you can see in here again, I've just said this is a font face and just specify pretty much what the font is and where to find it in the folder. And you can specify it's italic or normal. So these are just the exact same process for all my fonts that I've got in the folder, just saying this is the font, reference that font name in our fonts folder, which is in here. So let's just use an example. Um, this is Museo Slab 500. If we go to our fonts folder, you can see that's Museo Slab 500 that it's referencing. So it just knows to go and grab that font. All right, so now we've gone through setting up the CSS and fonts for our main sort of contents. If you've not used HTML, um, you can have, I suppose, global CSS that goes, that's specific to the whole document and not just specific to one HTML piece of content. So what I'll quickly show you is an example of that. If we look at, sorry, I'm going back and forth. But if we look at our Harissa Lamshanks title at the top, so that's using the global CSS from the app. And I'll show you where we put that in. So if we go to our layers and to default, we've got CSS in there as well. So I know at first glance, this seems quite confusing, so I'll just quickly talk you through it. So the CSS that we used here, that is specific to our VIPS HTML, because this HTML file is going to reference that CSS and those fonts. So you might have other HTML files in your document throughout that's referencing the shared CSS, but that's specifically for those single or you know multiple HTML files that you'll have throughout your document. If you just put in a text object, so for example, our recipe title is just a text object. As you can see, this text object, if we open it up, it only has the text in there. So it's not actually telling it how to style it. It doesn't know what font to use. So that's where the sort of the global CSS kicks in. That's in all for these text objects. So the 
global CSS lives in shared layers and default. And I'll just open this up and we call it style dash one CSS and we'll just open it up in Xcode again. So basically it works exactly the same as the other CSS for the recipe and the fonts that we've set up before. So the difference is we've just put all of the CSS in one long document. So what we do is we need to specify our fonts or tell where to go find our fonts. So it's exactly the same as before. We just say go and look in the fonts folder and go grab Mizio Sans 100 Italic. So this is all specifying our fonts. And then we go in and we now have to specify each one of those hyperlinks or text objects that we've added in our document. So this is our recipe title. We'll just navigate back and we'll go in here and that's our recipe title. So we need to specify how that's going to be styled. So we put in recipe title and we say we want the colour to be this. Font family, Museo Sans, we want the font weight to be 300 and you can specify size, line height and in this case we want to make it uppercase. So just underneath that you'll see a little something called the div which pretty much is just a box and all this is referring to is the second line of our recipe title. So it's saying recipe title paragraph 2. So what we want to do is we've got this second line or paragraph 2 that we want to have styled differently to the title. So again we just need to tell or take that second paragraph in the recipe title and style it differently. So we want the background to be black, we want the font size to be 16 and you can specify all of that in there. So that's our recipe title. The other bit that I've got in here which is not as relevant because I'm using an HTML document, um, HTML file in there. But if I, in my VIPS in here, if I would have used a text object, so maybe what I'll do is I'll create a text object in there and then you guys can see what the difference will be. So say if I've decided I don't need sort of my fancy recipes in here, I just need straight text. So I'll copy that out and let's go open up a text file. Close my text editor. I think I've closed it. Just create a new document and we want the format to be plain text. And I'll just copy that in. And we'll save this in my VIPS folder just so that you have an idea. So we'll just navigate to the folder and we'll call this S1 1. Oh, that's the wrong one. We're going in there. Save that in there, go back to our folder, and there's our just our straightforward text file. And I'm just gonna take that out for a minute and we'll load our go back to Orms Editor and we'll just load it up again. So just before I load it up, I'll just quickly show you that what we've done is in here we've said we want our VIPS one to be Museo Sans at 16 point. So that's sort of just globally styling that text file. And because we don't have an HTML file in there, we need to style it in our global CSS. So we'll go back in and we'll load our file in Inf Editor. 
go to templates and here you can see there's my text and it's styled on the CSS at 16 point. So that's sort of the difference between the two CSS. So I know at first glance it can be very confusing, um, but again, we'll send you the files, have a look at them. Once you get a, your head around it, it's actually quite straightforward. So I'll just put my folder back in there and delete my text file. And we'll just load up our final page again. So that's bringing us to the end of our webinar. Um, if you guys have any questions, please let us know. Um, you can either type them in the question and answer boxes um, or if you want to chat directly to us, uh, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. So yes, any questions, let us know. So we've got one question. Um, can we apply shared layer to an individual PDF files instead of a folder? So just to make sure I understand you correctly, Adi. Um, so you don't, so basically you want the layer to have a shared layer, is that right? Um, pretty much, I suppose a shared, it's, to answer your question straight, it's, it's you only attach a shared layer to a section folder. Um, if you have, do you have an example that you can maybe describe of, of how you want to attach a layer to another layer? So we've got so the PDF has got multiple pages, and you only want the last page to have the element. You can make the shared layer the last element. Yeah. So the shared layer would be the last element essentially. So whether you decide, you'd either place that as the last layer on top. So say we've got an example, and I'll bring up some a folder so that we can visualise this. So. So in here we've got, I'll just, for sake of an example, I'll copy a few layers out. So say this is going to be my second layer and this is going to be my third layer. And then if I understand you correctly what you're saying, you might want to have a P1-4 that only contains that one element. So if you only want it to be in this folder, what I would do is I'd just create that page with that single element as a fourth layer. But if you know this fourth layer, you'd want to use it, say, in our shared assets folder as well, that's when you'd actually pull it in and decide you'll make it a shared layer. So, you know, we copy that out, create a new layer folder, we'll say fourth select single, and or we'll pop it in there, and then you can either apply it to your folder, and if it's going to be multiple folders, and that element's always going to be that top layer, you can apply to that folder as well. Does that answer your question? I hope so. If, if not, let us know. Um, all right, we've got a few more questions. I mean, sorry, we've got, I'll just, we'll finish up the, okay, so you want to apply, okay, sorry, I now understand what you mean. You want to apply to multiple pages. So yes, you can. So basically, I'll just go, Adi, I'll go back through your examples. So what you're saying is, We've got a P1-2 and we might have a P3-1. So we've got three pages going down underneath each other. 
And what you're saying is you want to have a layer on top of P2-1. So yes, you can definitely do that. So it could just be that layer and you name this P2-3. So that's always going to put it on top of, it's going to be always going to be the third layer on the second page of your document. So basically layers work exactly the same as objects. What OOMF does, it has a look in here to see, okay, we've got a P1-1 and then it sees, okay, I'm attached to the social um, shared layer and then it will go have a look in there and whatever layer or layers that you have specified in there, it will then pull in to your document. All right, I have, now that I've answered your question, let me know if there's anything else. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next one. So, I've got a question from Layla. Um, can you use multiple pipes? Yes, you can. So, again, I'll just go back to my example. So, here we've got InDesign tips and I actually want to bring in a layer of both my single layer and my social layer. So all you do is you just add another pipe and you just add social at the back and you can have as many as you'd like. So you might have you know, four, shaded, four shared layers in there and you can just add them all to the, the end of your, your document name. All right, do we have any more questions, guys? I think we've answered all of them. Um, thank you so much for taking the time um, to join our webinar. Um, I really hope this gave you some tips of speeding up your production um, and just ways of how you can use them and make it easier for you to produce awesome apps. Um, please, we'll send you, like I said, we'll send you all the files um, this afternoon um, so you can have a look at them. We'll also send you a small survey. Um, if you can please take the time, um, fill, it, fill it out, let us know what you want more of. Um, we're doing these webinars for you guys, so we really want to know what you guys want to learn more of. So. Um, please let us know. And yeah, there's more webinars coming up um, and you can register for them at homepagehq forward slash webinars. Thanks again and have a lovely day.